Hundreds of thousands of Americans still without power in the state of Texas as yet another storm bears down on the United States. How much is global warming to blame? Hello, I'm Mike Walter sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Dangerously low temperatures continue to grip Texas as many residents struggle to cope without electricity, water, or gas. An unseasonably cold winter has caused the state's power grid to collapse, leaving millions in the dark at the height of the recent storms and no end in sight to this energy emergency. Snow and ice storms have wreaked havoc across the United States in recent weeks, leaving many to question if the extreme weather is a harbinger of climate change. Our own Sean Caleb's joining us now. And Sean, many Texans now in their sixth day without power or water and officials warning the blackouts could last for days. What more can you tell us about this? Well, you're exactly right. And it, it, to kind of break it down, there are two major power grids in the United States, one in the east, one in the west. But Texas, a state known for its individualism, has its own power grid. And it really isn't built or wasn't built to handle really high uh, demands of energy because of freezing cold weather this time of year. So it is completely overburdened and that is what has led to massive uh, power outages that has the governor and other officials within the state all pointing fingers looking at each other the best way to move forward uh, on this and it's uh, it's, it's proved to be fatal. A number of people have died either because of the cold weather or trying uh, to stay warm. And it is going to get worse. As you mentioned, another storm is going to punish that area. And a lot of pipes have frozen because it's also an area that doesn't have a great deal of insulation for its infrastructure within homes and businesses. And right now that's frozen. But when it thaws, it's just going to unleash massive flooding throughout a lot of buildings and cause all kinds of problems. OK, so how does global warming play into this, you may wonder? It's winter. It's supposed to be cold. But it's not supposed to be this cold, and it's not supposed to be like this in that part of the United States. Now, what a lot of geophysicists, a lot of people who study climate change are pointing at right now is the air stream, the jet stream. If you look, this time of the year, as the Earth tilts, it's really cold in the northern hemisphere, and the jet stream blows about 350 kilometers an hour just below that area, and it usually keeps that cold air socked in and from moving down. But the Arctic is warming up twice as fast as any other place on Earth. So what's happening, that warm air in the Arctic, unseasonably warm, is now causing the jet stream to lose uh, a certain degree of its integrity. So it's kind of looping down, and it is allowing what scientists call polar vortex to move down uh, into an area. They called it a cold snap when I was a kid. But it is moving down. It's happening more and more. And it's not just in Texas and parts of the United States. Look, there was a very, very powerful uh, tornado in the state of North Carolina. That shouldn't happen in the middle of uh, February. Parts of Greece, parts of Syria are also receiving snow right now. So a lot of people are looking to climate change. Uh, people think, look, it's just supposed to get warmer and warmer and warmer. No, that's not exactly the case. Even though the last five years have been the warmest on record uh, throughout the world, climate People who study climate change have said we're going to have freakishly powerful storms, and that is what folks are seeing. So they're going to have to rethink, if you listen to these scientists, the way everybody has done things in the past. And boy, don't the people of Texas know that tonight. Yeah, disruptions, extremes, we're certainly seeing it. Another big story we're following, the U.S. rejoining the Paris Climate Accord effective on Friday. How important is it for the U.S. to once again take a leading role when it comes to climate change? Well, this comes after four years of Donald Trump and America first and saying that uh, joining the Paris Accord, uh, something that had been worked on for years and years and years, and uh, China and the United States, really the two big leaders that pushed that through, and every nation on Earth except for two accepted it, and one didn't accept it because it didn't go far enough. So the United States, very frustrated, a lot of scientists were when Donald Trump chose uh, not to venture into that. And you're seeing this is the day it was signed. And of course, it was under the Obama administration and uh, uh, Joe Biden having a big hand in that. Uh, so a lot of people in the United States think it's absolutely imperative. Look, the world is changing. It's not going to be depending on fossil fuels nearly as much. Fossil fuels blame for putting uh, the, the, the harmful greenhouse gases into the air that warms up the atmosphere, warms up the earth, blamed for this uh, climate change. And virtually 99% of the scientists buy into this. But 
Uh, for the Trump administration, it was looking at the bottom line and saying this was going to cost the United States money. But a lot of people say absolutely not. In the long term, by investing in this kind of renewable energy, this green energy and moving forward, it's going to be better. You're going to have to retrain people. But that just hasn't happened. Like in the coal fields, Mike, uh, whether out west or whether in Appalachia, these people are not finding this kind of training. So there's a lot of frustration. There's no easy answer. And if you look back on Texas, if people did depend on electric cars, for example, they would be out in the cold literally right now trying to figure out how to charge their vehicles. So uh, if there's no simple answer to this, but people are focusing on it, and it is going to take a lot of work to move globally in that direction. Yeah, a lot of work. Uh, CGTN's Sean Caleb's there for us. Thanks so much uh, reporting from our newsroom. For more, let's bring in our panel with us here in Washington, D.C. Paul Bledsoe is an adjunct professorial lecturer at the American University Center for Environmental Policy. Also, Washington, Shweta Chakrabarty is a risk and behavioral scientist joining us from Arlington, Virginia. Chenghua Wu is CEO at the Beijing Future Innovation Center and from London. Bob Ward is the policy and communications director at the Granham Research Institute on Climate Change. I want to welcome all of you to the show. And Paul, why don't I begin with you? I mean, we're seeing these images coming out of uh, Texas. It's just incredible images. So much snow everywhere. Uh, people sleeping in their cars. Uh, they don't have water. Uh, the list goes on and on. And these pictures are being broadcast around the world. And this all comes on the heels of the fact that the United States has not done a very good job with the pandemic and then we had an insurrection uh, last month kind of a black eye for the u.s right now how is it in this state which is known for energy that can have so many problems thanks mike well listen uh climate change is here to stay with the vengeance the impacts from climate change are going to be felt all around the united states all around the world and all around the year it's not just a summer phenomenon in fact, the fire season in the western United States is now nine months a year. What we have to do is invest in a resilient, clean energy infrastructure. Joe Biden has a $3 trillion clean energy infrastructure bill in front of Congress right now. He's going to give his state, first State of the Union address next Tuesday night, and he's going to make clean energy infrastructure and resilience a centerpiece of his message. And a big part of that is the U.S. has to lead domestically in order to be able to lead internationally. Under Trump, the entire world slid backwards, including China and other major emitters. Biden has brought the U.S. back. Now's the time for us all to act together. Shweta, uh, the Forbes looked at Texas. They said if they were their own country, uh, if they were to secede from the United States for some reason, they would be the eighth largest economy in the world, uh, more so than Canada, South Korea, and Brazil. And yet uh, we're looking at this, this state, and it's having so many problems. Obviously, the, one of the largest economies in the U.S., Arkansas, its neighbor, is probably 34th. And there's this, this image that we've seen in the last couple of days of Texarkana, which is basically splits those states in half. One side, you see these clear roads. The other side, the, they're just blanketed with snow. Of course, that's the Texas side. So how is it that, that Texas finds itself this way? So Texas is really proud to be deregulated from central energy sources that the rest of the United States is more plugged into. It's because the citizens of the state have supply and demand, which is unique to Texas. And for that reason, they've been able to create this energy island. We don't see that in many other states or in other parts of the world. Usually supply and demand are not within the same region as such. And so Texas has been able to really take advantage of this. And there's pros and cons to it. The pros are is that energy is cheap and it's diversified. It's still primarily natural gas, but that doesn't mean that they don't have renewables. They do. Um, and this winter freeze really attacked all sources of energy. Really, none of them were spared. And it's also been really appealing to invest in Texas, both within the U.S. and outside of the U.S., because of the cheap energy that Texas has been able to have as part of the stable attraction to its economy for so long. But then now the cons are being made really clear. If you can't plug into a central energy source, when you have these types of unanticipated events, despite the fact that climate scientists have been predicting exactly these types of extreme weather events in places you wouldn't expect them for years, for decades, um, the state of Texas was not prepared with the generators it would normally have for extreme heat in the summer or for hurricane season. So this really did come unexpected, and we see now 
there's a lot of catching up to see where the resiliency wasn't there and where the redundancies failed, where the safeguards needed to be put in place. All of these things need to be part of real resilience and energy continuity building going forward for the state of Texas. And Chungwa, I want to bring you into the conversation because Republicans are, are using this uh, as an opportunity to really blame renewables for this problem. In fact, the uh, Texas governor says it's all the wind turbines problems, and that's why they're seeing this. Uh, and, and you see these politicians rather seizing on this as to make a case against broader climate efforts. What do you make of that? Uh, the truth is, uh, it's not. And so we all know, uh, I think, uh, cases uh, by cases around the world, even in many parts of this country, uh, demonstrated that renewable energy infrastructure, particularly resiliency infrastructure, is the only way forward. I think we were talking about a lot about the failures, actually, in Texas in particular. It's a case actually unfolding now. All the world is zooming in, actually, on this particular case, trying to understand how important the resilience is, literally, in the context of climate change what a failure it has been in the Texas context, actually, the energy system has failed to build the resilience elements into its current system. There's a huge lesson to be learned. Uh, I think many people are, are, are literally saying this is a man-made failure. And, uh, you know, 2011, uh, U.S. already experienced a similar event, extreme storm winter event already, and a lot of discussions back then pretty much talking about almost the same thing today we're talking about here, but somehow politicians have failed actually to take into consideration, take immediate actions to shift the energy structure toward a clean, resilient energy infrastructure. And China actually back in 2008 also experienced a similar situation and we learned tremendously from that process actually how important the grid infrastructure is in order to survive a way, you know, right through uh, such extreme weather events. I think lessons, we have plenty of them already. Very importantly, politicians need to put things in perspective, in the right perspective, so that they really take immediate actions to really follow the right way to shift the energy infrastructure from fossil fuel reliance to a clean, much cleaner uh, renewable energy future. Bob, uh, you have climate change deniers who say uh, it doesn't exist. They point to the cold weather. Um, but, but that's the point, isn't it? I mean, extreme weather conditions is part of all of this. I mean, we're seeing these hurricanes that are unbelievable. Uh, Sean mentioned a tornado uh, recently in an area where you just wouldn't expect at this time of year. These wildfires in Australia, a lot of people are pointing to climate change as one of the reasons for that. This is sort of the, what we're going to see unless this is tackled, correct? Yeah. Um, at this stage, I think it's still a bit speculative about how climate change might be linked to the uh, cold weather events that are happening in North America. Uh, but it's indicative of the problem we face, you see. We're in unprecedented territory. There are going to be nas um, nasty shocks that we don't expect, and we're going to have to adapt to them. That's why this is such a dangerous situation for us to be in. It's, if it was perfectly predictable how the climate was going to react, then we could plan. But the fact is that we don't know exactly how it's going to play out, and it makes it all the more difficult for us to cope. And the fact is that the climate is going to continue to change until we get all global emissions down effectively to zero. And over that period, we're going to have to adapt and become more resilient to these impacts. But of course, the United States is a rich country. It has the means to adapt. The real problem is going to be in developing countries where they don't have the resources to adapt, and it's going to be deadly. The scale of death and destruction and loss of livelihood in the developing countries is, is already unacceptably high, and it's going to get worse. So we really have to apply ourselves here, and, and the United States does need to show leadership domestically and internationally. Paul, uh, Bob making the point that the U.S. needs to take a step forward. Uh, of course, you mentioned uh, President Joe Biden making this one of his issues that he's uh, tackling early on in his administration. Of course, uh, Donald Trump removing the United States in June of 2017 from the Paris Accords. Um, the U.S. president had something to say about this crisis. Let's listen to what he had to say. And just like we need a unified national response to COVID-19, we desperately need a unified national response to the climate crisis, because there is a climate crisis. We must keep — we must lead global response, because neither challenge can be met, as Secretary Kerry has pointed out many times, by the United States alone. We know what to do. 
We've just got to do it. When we think of climate change, we think of it — this is a, a case where conscience and convenience cross paths, where dealing with this existential threat to the planet and increasing our economic growth and prosperity are one and the same. Paul, let me ask you about this. Uh, what did it mean for the United States to, to step out of the Paris Agreement in terms of that leadership position that he's talking about? How much ground was lost? Well, unfortunately, not only did the Trump administration roll back all the climate protections it could, but it didn't provide incentives for greater uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, electric vehicles, carbon capture, and all the technologies that we need to solve this problem. The U.S. has the technological capacity, but we need the economic and financial incentives to act. Biden is going to change that quickly. He has already signed a series of executive orders that re-regulate things like methane emissions. He's going to provide huge amounts of government funding and tax incentives for clean energy. He has proposed that the U.S. will have zero emissions from our electricity sector within 15 years, by 2035. He knows that will require a huge amount of investment in the U.S. economy. The good news here, as President Biden says, is this is a huge job creator. In the last uh, 15 years, we've created more than 3 million jobs in clean energy without even really trying. With the right government incentives and private sector investment, we're talking about millions and millions of new clean, good jobs in the clean energy transition. So this is where he's talking about our climate interests and our economic interests finally dovetailing, given the fact that we have the energy technologies. Now we need to deploy them. And, and Paul, uh, global warming, though, is worse than it was in December of 2015, I was reading, when the climate deal was signed in Paris. Um, tapping, taking the foot off the gas pedal, uh, the U.S. just kind of removing itself uh, for these years, have other countries also uh, seen some backsliding in terms of trying to reach their goals? Yes. So we're seeing what we're seeing is the fact that the U.S. was not leading the charge and primarily the U.S. and China were involved in the first signing of the Paris Accords in being able to really energize and mobilize other countries around the world to also commit to their NDCs, their nationally distributed uh, determined contributions. We are seeing a lot of lofty words, but not necessarily really well thought out plans to reach those goals. And as Paul just laid out, the urgency is, in, is, is ever more clear. We know that the financing for this needs to also be raised. Even though clean energy is getting cheaper, where are the low-cost finance mechanisms that are supporting the infrastructure to be able to have meaningful overhaul of sectors across countries and around the world to ensure that there is stable energy still available to these countries while they grow and develop? And I'm, we're talking about the ones that are not, that haven't enjoyed all the benefits of fossil fuel energy for the last several decades. And so we need to be realistic and think about how we are going to see this transition in real terms. And in, that is also aligned to economic growth goals of these countries. Because ultimately, nuclear is definitely going to have to play a role in seeing a transition to renewables. And that's fine as long as we are able to reach the NDCs that have been put forward by the countries. Um, that have committed to the Paris Accords. There really is no other choice at this stage. And Chung, uh, China is welcoming the news that the U.S. has once again joined the Paris deal. I was in uh, Hangzhou in 2016 at the G20 summit when uh, President Xi and President Obama announced that they were going to join the Paris Accords. This was an area where these two countries could collaborate. We've seen so much tension in the last four years under the Trump administration. Do you see an effort here where these two countries can come together with a shared goal? I think the conversation, the Chinese New Year conversation call between our two presidents definitely uh, sent a very positive signal. Uh, the message was, uh, you know, was given in a way uh, the two countries were trying to figure out actually how to work with each other. And of course, the U.S. on one side wanted to isolate and just say, let's just work on climate change, put the other uh, disagreements on the side where China probably wouldn't really agree with that. So I think it's a still a long way to go in terms of how the two countries can really work with each other to advance the agenda. But other than that, 
Uh, I don't think the world or each country is waiting for the others actually to take actions there. Even in the last four years, China didn't really wait for the U.S. to change. Uh, rather, China has been gearing up uh, towards aggressively developing renewable energy, uh, developing what we call a smart new infrastructure to really to shift uh, the fossil fuel reliance and sort of infrastructure towards uh, clean energy or smarter clean energy infrastructure there. So China is already moving forward, but the world actually really needs the two countries to work together rather than fighting with each other over disagreements. I think first thing first, the two countries, the top leadership really need to come together to work out more details in terms of how the two actually not distract the rest of the world, but rather really working hand in hand to move the global agenda. Chung, uh, Beijing's goal is to be carbon neutral by 2060, but uh, it's still so reliant on coal. How does it deal with its short-term goals and align those with the long-term goals? Uh, since the announcement by the president uh, around this carbon neutrality before 2060, uh, you could imagine a united uh, sort of front is shaping up and emerging in the country. Everyone is trying to, you know, jumping in, trying to figure out how, so how to solve the puzzle. It is difficult. There's no doubt about it. China continues to rely on fossil fuels and to shift to such a large economy, actually, together towards new renewable energy. It's not a cause of possible task to deliver short term, mid term. Uh, what's encouraging is that the government has pretty much put its mind set on clean technology, renewable energy, uh, smart grids, all the technology development. But in the meantime, actually also looking into uh, technologies like uh, carbon capture and storage and looking into the nature's uh, sort of carbon sink capability. Uh, so I think the CCSU or CCUS is uh, recognized as a big part of the solution besides nuclear. And uh, so that we'll be able to, maybe we still continue to rely to a certain extent the fossil fuels, but we have to make sure, make sure we capture, you know, all the emissions and turn that either, uh, you know, sequestered or stored or into the utilization, uh, into some resources, actually. I think technology is very excitingly available today. And uh, so it's a very sort of interesting landscape coming together so that all the numbers actually would add up and also deliver the carbon neutrality before 2060, it's very possible. Shweta, of course, China is not alone when it comes to uh, being a, a polluter. Uh, we look at India. This is a headline from a Bloomberg story from 2019. India's deadly, dirty addiction to cheap coal is getting worse. Of course, they have one of the largest, uh, the largest coal mining company of the world is uh, in India. You've got the United States, China, and India. They really need to make a concerted effort if we're going to see any kind of impact at all. In fact, the U.N. Secretary General talking about that. He's raising the alarm. Let's listen to what he had to say. The world remains way off target in staying with the 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Agreement. And this is why we need more ambition, more ambition on mitigation, ambition on adaptation, and ambition on finance. Words are not enough. By COP26 at the latest, all countries need to come forward with significantly more ambitious nationally determined contributions with 2030 targets consistent with a net zero pathway. Sweda, he wants ambitious plans. Is he going to get them? He absolutely needs to. India is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to the impacts of climate change. And there's so much that needs to be overhauled in that country across sectors, especially agriculture. 50% of workers are involved in some capacity in agribusiness, and ultimately they, they are suffering from the extreme impacts of climate change already, not to mention predictions of what is to come. Uh, heavy precipitation events have increased threefold since 1950, and that's, that's fueled part of the farmer protests that we're seeing in Delhi. And so it's really critical to recognize that there are ripple effects that are stemming from the lack of action around mitigating against climate change. And it's not just it's not just one country or the business of one country, but it ultimately impacts the future of a country and the collective future of the world. Bob, uh, we've talked about the U.S., we've talked about China, we've talked about India. Let's talk a little bit about Europe. They're announcing an ambitious goal as well. The bloc is planning to spend $1.2 trillion over the next decade trying to reshape uh, energy, transport, farming, industry to slash emissions. Um, let me ask you about their, their efforts to become climate neutral by 2050. Is this achievable? Uh, yes, it is. And the critical thing that Europe has realized is that the transition to a zero carbon climate resilient economy is the central growth story. It is the story 
of how Europe is going to progress economically over the coming decades. And that's a critical insight that will allow them to pursue their goal for increasing living standards and uh, increasing prosperity whilst reducing emissions. Now, it's not going to be easy. We know how to do it in things like the power sector, where it's, uh, we know what technologies we need. Uh, we can do it on transport. You know, we can electrify the um, land transport system, electric vehicles. But there are still some sectors that are going to be still quite difficult and we don't quite know how we're going to do it. Things like steel making and concrete, uh, aviation. We can see, beginning to see how we might do that, but we're not quite there yet. And that's where we need to see really big breakthroughs. But the fact that Europe understands that you do not have to sacrifice your economy in order to tackle climate change is a critical insight and gives them a key advantage. And that's the insight that the United States needs to come to now, that it's economic future and indeed as we all try and grow out of, um, in the period after the pandemic those countries that recognize that investing in the transition to zero carbon climate resilient economy that will drive growth that will drive prosperity that will drive an increase in well-being Shweta, uh, Biden is convening a summit of world leaders in April to ramp up action on the Paris Agreement what do you think uh, can come out of a, a gathering like that it's really sending a signal that this is a 180 degree turn from the international relations that the Trump administration had made normalized. So we are no longer going to be following suit of what did not work for four years. We are instead going to be leading the charge and overhauling not just within the United States because the, he has been able to appoint some incredibly um, appropriate people for the positions to do what needs to be done within the United States across various industries and with the core tenet of environmental justice and racism at its heart. So that's really critical and important, too. And John Kerry, as the presidential climate envoy, is working closely, not just within, within the domestic appointments, but also with our allies abroad to ensure that there isn't, there isn't a hypocrisy anymore that we were seeing through the Trump administration. Rather, what we are putting out there, we are also doing at home. And that's going to be a clear signal that is sent from the summit coming up. chung -Wong, I think we have about 30 seconds. Uh, do you see climate diplomacy being kind of at the heart of the U.S. and China coming together on some of these issues? To a certain extent, it is. But I don't think it, you know, uh, it will overwhelm everything else. But we all know it's a shared vision. We have to address this actually together. So I think climate diplomacy will bilaterally will have a very critical role to play to define how the world is moving forward. And it's certainly an issue we'll be following in the days, months, years ahead. Thank you all for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.